so, so that's, uh, that's where all this came from. It's a totally arbitrary. There's no scientific evidence that germs can only jump five feet, but not 60. And, uh, you know, you pick up illnesses from airborne uh, things from sneezing and coughing, and we all know about that. We have always been taught to cover our mouth when we cough and go wash our hands before we eat and, and uh, take a bath once or twice a day. And uh, the Israelites learned all those things long ago from Moses, who learned it from God. And, of course, Ellen White was great on hygienic uh, methods of, of treating illness, but also of preserving health. And that's what we're really anxious to do, is preserve our health. Um, I was listening this morning to Conrad Vine, who you probably have heard of. He, he had a talk on uh, YouTube. He kind of talks in code now, so they don't bump him off YouTube. And Conrad Vine, who is the president of Adventist Frontier Mission. And uh, Adventist Frontier Mission is a, is a great organization that gets young people out into third world countries. And my daughter, when she was, she was uh, 16, she wanted to start a business. And, and then she found out she had to be 18 to get a business license. So she went into babysitting for a business, saved all her money, and paid her way to New Guinea for the Adventist Frontier Mission program. And then she, uh, she spent one year there, which was an assignment to teach the other missionaries children. She found that quite boring because those children were not eager learners of a culture like missionaries are supposed to be. So she went back for a second year, raised enough uh, the support from friends to have a whole container of supplies shipped over, medical supplies and uh, blankets and clothes and, and books, lots of books. And then that was shipped over to New Guinea. And for six months, she was up, uh, up the May River, about two hours from the nearest station and the only white person in the village for months. And uh, I, I'll just tell you a little family insight there, because this, this is the one that came back and started a bakery and now has a vegetarian restaurant. And, uh, and her college was basically living in New Guinea. So when she came back, she'd matured. She was a, a committed Christian. She even learned over there that they treated her with more respect when she wore a dress. She went over like a lot of teenagers these days with jeans and things like that, work clothes, and, and she found out that uh, the native women that were the respected ones dressed, in, and it was traditional for the ladies to dress <laughs> modestly, uh, at least from the waist down, but the, uh, the men, of course, they wore little or nothing, and and they treated her with more respect when she dressed like a lady, you know. So she, she was telling her dad all these things, and I was putting it in newsletters as she told me how they bathed in the river and, and the, how the crocodiles had got one person. And, and, and they said, are you afraid to have your daughter over in New Guinea uh, uh, among all those natives and the crocodiles and the... Uh, malaria mosquitoes. I said, no, I'd be more concerned if she were in one of our colleges here in the USA. And, as, and that was before woke thinking was taking over the, and so, so I, was, I was very happy with the investment we made in sending her daughter there because I knew that if she uh, didn't make it back, she would be safe to save for eternity, having devoted her life. And then a few years later, as she married and started having children, her oldest daughter went to Nigeria to do student missionary work there. But uh, she, she got laid to rest in Nigeria. She died of acute malaria, and uh, 
and he had to have a funeral for her. At age 18, when you give a young person to the Lord, he, he takes them and he knows what's best, but that was a sad thing to, to our family. Anyway, she's got five other children that are <laughs> going strong. <laughs> that doesn't mean that one is, isn't sadly missed especially the oldest, but Miriam was teaching sewing there in, in Nigeria, and she taught the ladies how to sew their own clothes. I hope you ladies who know how to sew and mend and repair. Uh, it's so easy to go to Goodwill or Pennies or stores now to buy clothes made in Vietnam and China and all that, that we're getting, we're losing the art. But here's, here's what her class was. She had three projects they had to do. The first was cutting out a dress from cloth and make their own pattern out of newspaper. So they'd put it up and try to get approximate size, and, and then with scissors, they'd cut it out, and they would sew that dress together with needle and thread. Now, I, I would guess probably relatively few of you could really make a nice looking Sabbath dress <laughs> with needle and thread and, and a hand pattern. Uh, if they did well on that, the second assignment was to uh, use a pattern and, and, and then cut it out and pin it together and sew it with a hand crank sewing machine. Because where there's no electricity, you know, you're either using the old treadle type, but that's too heavy to take over to another country, so they had a hand crank one. And if they did well on that, then the third project was a uh, electric sewing machine. They, oh, they felt like they'd just gotten a Tesla car, you know, to ha use an electric sewing machine to, to sew their dress. And, uh, and they did nice work. They just loved her because she loved them. You know, you, you go to another country, you can't have any racial prejudice, color prejudice, Religious prejudice, you, you just go with love in your heart for people, and that's, that's what Miriam did. So what I'm going to uh, share with you today is some demonstrations of treatments that you can do not only here in the church uh, facility, but at home. Because really the, the bottom line is to know hydrotherapy for your own home. And that you can even go to a neighbor's home and help them. And so that's where I'm starting where I left off yesterday about what's happening to this vision. And we want to show the advantages of hydrotherapy, not as the cure-all, but as one of the eight remedies that help uh, you to get well and, and then something to have some cautions and, and all of that. And, and I have a book that is on the back table. And if any of you need a home reference, uh, Get Well of Home is the name of the book. And hold it up here. Uh, yeah, it's, it's hundreds of pages uh, with a, a, a long chapter, about 70 page chapter on hydrotherapy, chapter 17 in the book deals with treatments, their indications, what I'm teaching you today. So you don't have to take notes if you get the book. It's $20. It's a, a bargain, a lot less than going to the urgent care and checking in and having your throat swabbed. And so uh, the whole idea of, of that was putting myself out of business, but it hasn't worked yet. And, and it also... I realized years ago that the coming crisis is going to put all of us out in the community to serve the health principles. So what you, what you get today, I want you to hang on to, like this fisherman. I see there's one or two fishermen here that can get the impact of that uh, picture. And now I'm going to change to the other. Uh, okay. 
And this is called the practical applications of hydrothermal or hydrotherapy. And, and we want to make it practical. So let's, let's pray today that the Lord will bless our time together. Dear Father in heaven, I pray that you will be with our group here today. Help us to shine for you and to honor you and serve you with gladness. And to serve one another too, that we can be a shining light for Jesus. In his precious name, amen. Now, the, the objectives of our class is to learn the benefit and some of the risks of hydrotherapy, to apply and demonstrate the techniques and for acute and some common health conditions, and to uh, apply them to specific illnesses with some cautions. And that's what I hope to do today, to make the treatments practical. Now, you probably have read these statements, but Ellen White wrote in the, in the book Councils on Diet and Foods, which has got a few statements that are not a, just about diet and food. In health and sickness, pure water is one of heaven's choicest blessings. Its proper use promotes health. It is the beverage which God provided to quench the thirst of animals and man Drunk freely, it helps to supply the necessities of the system and assist nature to resist disease. And I see there's at least two or three people who had to have a water bottle here that you're going to be sipping on and, and uh, enjoying. And there's, I understand there's good water here from a well, which is, which is excellent. Now, what I brought is a, is a bag of things that are spread out on the table, but I would recommend that in every home you have some sort of place where you can keep a hydrotherapy kit. This, this came from Bymart, I think it was, and uh, I've even got a blanket in here. And I, otherwise it's now empty, but, but you can see you can uh, pack a lot of stuff in a duffel bag, and it's soft. I've taken bags like this on, on an airplane to teach and share, and you can throw it in your car and you're off and running, like a first aid kit or a bug out bag if you like to rough it. <laughs> and, and I don't have time to bring my bug out bag that I carry in my truck because I could uh, pitch a little tent and start a fire and purify water and things like that, but that's not my subject today. There's several things you need. As, as a hydrotherapist, you need uh, clean hands, so you should know how to wash your hands and sanitize them. I don't mean just a pump of sanitizer, but soap and water. Uh, hydrotherapists need uh, a file so that their fingernails are not sharp. You don't want to give somebody massage and then they say, ouch, the very next thing. So you want your fingernails to be nice. Yeah, this is a thermometer, believe it or not. We used to put them under the tongue or under the arm, but this one can uh, give you your temperature. 97.5, he's okay. Your, your skin temperature is more in the 97s than it is in the 98s usually. So, so we would always take a person's temperature. And if you're going to do therapy, you might as well do your own to make sure you're Run, not running a fever that day. Uh, I would recommend that. I have here a pulse oximeter. Are you all acquainted with those? This, this very quickly, if you just stick your finger in it, measures your pulse rate, tells you if your pulse rate is regular, and, uh, and your oxygen levels. And if you're doing any hydrotherapy that involves heating the body, this is a quick way to check the regularity of the heart rate and uh, make sure that they're not hypoxic or low on oxygen uh, as, as you see in emphysema and, and many times in COVID. Uh, we've had many patients with COVID that have gotten down in the low 80s and they're very short of breath and they're feeling apprehensive. Sometimes it drops into the 70s and then 
then you get a little nervous about it and feel like they need oxygen. And it used to be that if it got that low, they'd be hovering over you with a ventilator in the emergency room and wanting to basically paralyze your respiration, put you on a ventilator. The only problem is there, there was a doctor in New York that found out that what was the physiologic abnormality was more like uh, altitude sickness than it was acute respiratory failure as we see in emphysema. And that the need was oxygen, it was not for uh, pressure. The ventilator increases the pressure on the lungs and people were dying on the ventilator. You know, they figured like, well, it's too bad, the, the illness got them. But it wasn't that, they needed high amounts of oxygen, like 10 liters per minute, uh, as you'd give somebody that was acute uh, altitude sickness or uh, had almost drowned. So, so here's, here's what Ellen White says about this. Now I'm going to talk a little about equipment and then go into a series of treatments. This, this is a massage table, and, mo and this one has holes in both ends, and what goes in here is a face cradle so that if you're lying on your stomach, and, and we would always throw a sheet over it uh, and, and go over it maybe with a little Lysol spray or, or uh, wipe it down so that, so that it, you always start clean, but where you're lying someone down on the table, you want them to lie on something white, <laughs> nice and clean. And, and it doesn't have to be ironed, but it should be, uh, if, if it's dried in a dryer, it's pretty well sanitized or hung up on a clothesline. You're going to let ultraviolet light sanitize it. So, so we would uh, use this as a table, and if you're, on, if you're prone on your stomach and getting a massage, your face goes with a hole in the middle so that, you're, uh, so that you're not turning your head to one side while you're getting a massage and getting a crick in the neck. And so, but on your back, this, this is, works fine, and we'll use it for some fomentation demonstrations. But first of all, I want to share a few other items. Um, you probably won't need this. But some of you might be used to it. You know what this is? An oxygen mask. And here's the bag. Like when you get on the airplane, they say if pressure drops, this will drop down and you put it on and, and don't worry if the bag doesn't inflate. And what are you supposed to do first? Put it on all the children you want to keep. <laughs> no, you're supposed to put it on yourself first and then on somebody else. Uh, I've, I have done altitude chamber work in Oklahoma at the uh, aerospace place, and when it drops suddenly, like uh, pressurization is lost in an airplane, you have about 15 seconds to get this on before you go unconscious when you're at 35,000 feet. If you're at 25,000 feet, you have about, uh, about 30 or 40 seconds, which isn't a lot of time before the lights go out, you know. So, so they mean what they say. There, there was one missionary that was going down to Central America and, and uh, a, a team from, from a church in Michigan and when they landed, uh, two of the teammates were slow in coming. They, d they weren't getting there through customs, and they wondered what's happened to them. And so one of them went back to see where they left the airplane, and there were the two student missionaries doing CPR on somebody who had just collapsed and had a heart attack. And, and they said, does anybody have emergency services here in the airport. And they said, uh, they, they brought, a man brought an oxygen mask, but it was not connected to any oxygen. 
And I, and, and, and I, I want to assure you that it does no good to just put this over your nose <laughs> with a long tube hanging out unless there's a bottle on the other end. And, and, and so one of the stewardesses went back in the airplane and came out with one of their bottles of oxygen, plugged it in, and then they said, can we call an ambulance? They said, we, we can call them, but they never come until the person is stabilized. Well, you, there's the one country, at least, you don't want to have a cardiac arrest in. And so here are these young people, help save the life of a man, actually, and got him stabilized before he uh, was able to get more professional help. Now, I think that's enough for now, except that if you ever have somebody that uh, has a sudden cardiac arrest and you need to do CPR, if you do mouth breathing, nowadays they don't teach mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, they just teach closed chest compression. And that's not enough because the ABCs of resuscitation is the airway, the breathing, and the circulation. And so uh, here's a, this is called a filter shield that you could put over the mouth and nose and it has a hole in both sides with a one way uh, so that you could breathe for a person without getting their spittle or vomitus and any contamination. Uh, not bad in every first aid situation. Okay, so now I'm going to go to the contrast bath. And we will, we will start with the foot. You can do contrast baths in a bathtub. Uh, I have a friend that does it in a hot tub and then he has a barrel beside the hot tub that he has at outdoor ambient temperature, which is cool, and if he needs more, he throws ice in it. But uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna do it in the feet, and, and Hank is gonna help me here. Yes, I would. So I'd like you to put hot water in one, if you don't mind, and uh, Cold water, we'll just use cold tap water so you don't have to use your ice. And, and so uh, we'll, we, you can wait until we get the materials here. The, the contrast, by, by the way, when you, when you give hydrotherapy treatments, you, you don't want to make extravagant claims like this will cure everything, grow back the hair on your head and, and uh, make your skin rejuvenate. You don't want to make uh, unrealistic claims. That's, that's political, that's not medical. So you, but you also need to be enthusiastic about it and confident that this is gonna help. Yeah, and you might even say, well, it's helped me whenever I've needed to do it or I've used it in my home and, and so it can help you. So you want to, inspire confidence in the people that you're treating. And what this does, as the uh, cold and the heat are used in contrast, we call it vas vascular gymnastics. Just like you would do with weights in your hands like this, you'd use one set of muscles and another set of muscles. And so the heat dilates the blood vessels by relaxing their tension, and then it contracts the blood vessels and then sends the blood somewhere else. So, so that increases the oxygen and the nutrients that goes to the body and gets rid of the waste products. Did you know that your cells are constantly producing waste products too? One being carbon dioxide. But don't let the, uh, you know, the, the new scientists make you think that you're poisoning the, the atmosphere or causing global warming by breathing. <laughs> they, the trees take in the carbon dioxide out there and they give out the oxygen. So it's a cycle of nature. Now, this 
I think this month or last month, the National Geographic had an article on this, and they, and they said that we, we have uh, all this population explosion has increased the temperature of the, around the world by uh, 0.7 degrees. Well, in the course of a day, it goes up many degrees, up and down, and 0.7 degrees is not going to make the uh, ocean rise more than of a quarter of an inch or so, and then, and they call those tides too. <laughs> Goes up and down several feet. So, I just, I say, where is the science in all this? And they say it has it has been increasing rapidly over the last five million years. Now, I don't think there's anybody on this planet that even knows what the temperature was like. Uh, 500 years ago. Set, set this down right here. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Okay, so, so now we're going to do a hot and cold treatment. Oh, we need it side by side. Okay. Now you kick your flip-flops off, and we will... Yeah, you all do this at communion service. This is, this is a, uh, why don't you sit to the side here and we'll just turn this. So, which do you think we should put his feet in first? Oh, that's a good idea. So he doesn't run away in the first 30 seconds. Okay, and then what you want to do before you put anyone's feet in the water, you want to test it with your own hand. If you can put your hand in it, and, and then you might even want to splash the feet or dip it and come it out. I'm sure someone in the kitchen has tested it out too, but we don't trust, you know, somebody in another room for doing it right. Yes, that's true. And especially if your feet are cool, it'll be sensitive. So you can lift them out and dip it a couple times if you want to. And then... Usually you get adjusted to it. Now this, this is not adequate for a sprained ankle because we would want the water to come up to mid-calf level. Uh, and we would, uh, I've, I would use a waste basket for that. Or a five gallon bucket that's big enough to put the feet in flat, not, not one that's tapered. So, so now if it's cool in the room, We'd throw a blanket around his shoulders and wrap it around his knees so that you're keeping someone from getting chilled. And, and this, we're going to uh, time for about three minutes. Three to five minutes, but three minutes is fine. Now, it's more likely that the hot water will cool off than that the ice water will get too warm because it's got ice cubes floating around in it. So it's not going to warm up appreciably, but this will cool off. So normally when I'm doing this kind of treatment, I would have a pitcher of hot water. And, and if I'm pouring some in, I pour it not directly on the feet, but maybe in a little corner that I've shielded with my hand. So you don't ever pour hot water. Here, here comes some. This, this is a, a marvel. Let's set it right down here. Thank you. Okay. You could use that too, but they, they'll get quite warm. And so, you, no, just a few, li tiny little bit. That would work too. So here we have some, uh, this is very hot water. And you don't want to spill it and get it all over the carpet. So we would just take a, a little scoop and uh, pour it in like that and then stir it around with your hand. Now, I, I saw a protocol drawn up for the treatments here. And it said that the therapist should always wear all the per personal protective equipment and uh, and. Uh, gloves on their hands. I've never used gloves on my hands at communion, and I never used it in a hydrotherapy department yet. I do use it when I do surgery or 
take out a splinter or uh, check somebody that's got an infection. So how's that doing? Is that feeling nice and warm now? Yeah. Okay. Now we're going to do a, a contrast, and, and we're going to see how brave uh, this <laughs> brother is. Just, and you just plunge him right in. And, and he's, a, he's a, I don't know if this is called cooperation or just uh, ignorance or bravery, but I think I would call it bravery. Uh, now what are we doing with the cold water? We're constricting. Usually the hot water, the feet get red and, and the blood comes and, and even the legs and the knees and everything warm up and a person may even start sweating. But now the cold, he's not going to start shivering, except it's very uncomfortable. And for to start with, 30 seconds is adequate for the contrast. And then we get the, the blessing of going back in the hot water. Let me add a little heat now and just... Okay, we'll go back now. And, and you want to do at least three changes. But if you're dealing with a migraine headache, or something that's very intense and you're trying to draw blood down from the head to the feet, you might want to do the contrast six or seven times. Um, yeah, it, it would. But, and he's beginning to sweat a little bit in his forehead. So we can do that and and I don't, I don't usually get the cold compress out of the basin that the feet have been in <laughs> to put on the head. You, you understand, we, we got, this isn't a rinky-dink place, this is some class too. Okay, so we said that this could be added while it's blending or something. Yeah. Later on while you do this, because then yes, if the, if the room is, if it's drafty or if it's cold, but, but in this setting we, we don't need to do that. And, and you don't have to at home if you're in a warm room. Okay. When do you observe uh, common cold? What kind of situation? Okay, I'm going to show you here. I think I've covered that subject. Indications. Infections. If you've got a, an infection in, the, in that part of the body that's localized, whether it's in your hand or your feet. If you're doing the hand contrast, the kitchen sink is nice if you have a two, two sinks. You can put the hot water in one and the cold in the other. But my recommendation is before you do that, spray it out and sanitize it like you would if you were canning so that you don't, uh, so that you don't use, yeah, we'll just set that right up here. Oh my, that's wonderful. <laughs> You see, you see the, the therapist gets a little bit of the uh, cold on his hands too. And, and what I do here is fold it about three times and then put it like that. Use, and I'll just, you'll, you'll need to hold it. I don't have a, a shower cap here. What I often use is just put a little a cloth or, or a plastic shower cap on the head to hold it on. Yes, yes, that's true. Uh, thank you for that. But uh, we can just put it up a little higher. And, and we want to keep the head cool because we want the blood not to go to the head and cause congestion and a headache. I was going to tell you about an experience with a person with migraine and it's harder to deal with than just a tension headache. But uh, I got a call one night from a Bible instructor. He was at a home, and, and he and his wife were giving a Bible study, and the person wasn't getting it because they had a migraine. And yeah, thank you. You, 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 you time now. <laughs> See, you can just pass it on and can do it himself. And, uh, and he said, what do I do? This, this 
young lady had been to the emergency room. She'd been given a shot of Demerol. She'd gone to another emergency room. She was a drug user, and she knew how to uh, get the emergency room doctors to give her the drugs and get, get her on her way. But even with all those drugs, her migraine was still there, and, and her brain wasn't getting the doctrines uh, of the Bible study. So, so uh, I said, give her a hot and cold foot bath. And so he got all the stuff. There we go. He's, he's catching on very fast. That's good. And, and uh, after a while, he called back, and he said, it's not working. Well, it was a bad case, you know. Here it's drug resistant, and, and she was uh, in pain. I said, keep it up. And about seven or eight changes of this, and her headache went away. And I, and I, I said to uh, her name was Grandma Svensson. She was our hydrotherapist, from a lady from Denmark that had worked at Scottsburg Sanitarium. I said, Grandma, it wor it, the Lord worked a miracle. And she said, miracle nothing. It's the natural result of hydrotherapy. <laughs> so, OK. So now, yes. Yes. A lot of my patients get really bad migraines. And I've got them on all kinds of yeah. stuff. And sometimes it works. And most of the time, it doesn't. Yes. So when you talk about, I know the concept of doing hot and cold therapy. My grandma was a nurse from the 20s. And so I grew up with this sort of thing. When you're talking about doing the thing back and forth, like you said, seven times, for a really tough case, are you talking about uh, like one, I guess you would call it a set, where you're doing, what, three minutes, three to five minutes in mm -hmm. hot, and how, I don't know how to do the cold. But about 30, 30 seconds to one minute in the cold. Uh, okay, so you do one set, are you talking about doing seven sets? Yes, seven changes. Oh, okay. Yep. okay, I just wanted to be clear on that. Yep, like okay. the animals that went into the ark, seven, okay. ar seven pairs. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, there are dietary things. You want to avoid any foods containing tyramine. Okay. Now we'll make this the last one. Okay. Now on the on the head, you can you you can sometimes just turn it over and get more cold, or you can dip it in the ice and wring it out again. Some of the questions that are being asked here, back here we can't hear, so if you just repeat them. Okay. Some people have a loud enough voice we can hear, but I did not hear Jeff and I did not hear Hank just now, so I'm going to oh. to repeat so the rest of us can hear what was asked. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll try to remember that. I have a question for the accent. Yes. Yes. Right. And with the acupuncture, I, I help them a lot. Uh huh. But, uh, when you do the hot and cold, if you do with the hot fermentation and yeah. the hot, it will release the, you know, the yeah. hot fat. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think it's worth doing. It's, it's not often done in an emergency room because uh, it takes so much time. It's fa faster to pull up a medicine in a needle and give them a shot and send them on their way to the cashier. Now, you want to dry the feet thoroughly, and, and there's an exception to finishing in cold. Uh, you want to dry between the toes. And... Uh, Uh, okay, I'll let you put your shoes on and just sit. Uh, trigeminal neuralgia is a, is a different problem. It, it's in the nerve of the, fa the facial nerve, the trigeminal nerve, and it's a shooting pain, and it does better with heat to that area. 
then I would use heat and not, not cold contrast. You want to minimize the touching of the area because it can trigger the, the pain. Now, we finished in cold and then dried his feet thoroughly and then he gets to rest for a half an hour. There's, you know, that's kind of a rule of thumb, but not a, a fixed rule. You don't have to arbitrarily time a half an hour of rest. Some people are, are in a hurry and they are up and go. But here are some of the conditions. And you say, why treat headaches when we're treating the feet? Why not just treat the head? Well, there's an uh, ice pack to the head. Can, can be uh, useful at times. Where's my ice pack? Here's, here's one of the common kinds. I hadn't used this in so long that when I filled it with water the other day, it was, it was <laughs> dripping out the bottom. So I, I'm not going to use it today because it's uh, cracked and dried out. But you, and it just like if you get rusty in using hydrotherapy, uh, you, you won't do as good a job either. But this ice, this is a, an ice uh, pack, you know, you put ice water in it like that. Uh -huh. And uh, what I found at, through the years was if I could put my feet in the hot water and the ice on the head, mm -hmm. that would some just those two changes there. Yes. Made a difference. Yes. For me yes. Personally, right, and and that's good. Uh, using the ice and the on the top and the heat on the bottom. Now, the exception to finishing in cold would be if you're going to give a massage afterwards uh, and you want the feet to stay warm. So, so I would finish in the warm water before doing a massage. I would, I would not finish in the ice for that. I'd do the contrast, but finish in warm water. So now there's a caution. Uh, if the, there's edema in the ankles and the feet from Swelling, be careful about the heat. You know, don't just depend on your back of your hand for the heat. Uh, be, if a person has diabetes and, and they're controlling it with diet, that's no problem. But if they have prolonged diabetes, even type 2, where they have lost nerve sensation in the feet and they don't have feeling of temperature in the feet, then it's up to you to watch that. And I would use a thermometer, something like, I, I don't have one, but uh, a candy, a candy, a, a candy thermometer, or one of those that you probably don't bake turkeys and stuff like that. But you know, there's the the housewares department of most big stores has a thermometer that you can put in water to measure the temperature. There's actually a really good thermometer. It's exactly what you're talking about. I just bought one, but my dog chewed it up. Um, they've got them at the kitchen store in Grants Pass, and it's, it almost looks like one of them old school thermometers, but it's got a digital thing on the top of it. Mm -hmm. They sell them at that, what's the name of that kitchen store on Main, on Main Street? Oh, no. <laughs> Yes, and, and now you can get one that has a metal probe. It's not glass, and it's not yeah. likely to break and, and spill the mercury out. So you, you get one of the newer, safer kinds, yeah, di kind digital. Of thank, thank you for that suggestion. OK, so now if you've got poor circulation, obviously the blood <laughs> isn't going to move back and forth as quickly. You may want to do a more snappy changes of the contrast or moderate the heat and, and the cold so that it's uh, not as great a temperature shift. And, and uh, the, the reason is because we don't want to do any harm with this. And we wouldn't want to uh, push the circulation beyond what your heart and your circulatory system is capable of doing. If there's a blood clot in the legs, 
We don't do the hot and cold because we're not trying to dislodge the clot. And so we would use warm water or a, a warm heating pad, one of these kind, like the, the electric ones, that would give heat to the legs and, and not massage or circulate. Just be ultra careful if there's a blood clot. But heat is good therapy for it. Even in hospitals today, they use heat for a thrombosis of, of the leg, leg veins. Um, the suspicion would be if the, if the, the you, oh, I, I, sir, uh, the question was, how would you know if there's a blood clot? If there's, there's two things that I could tell you, and, and they're in my book too. Uh, one is the calf. If you squeeze the calf muscle and it's painful or tender or feeling hot to you, that's a sign that there may be a blood clot. Uh, uh, it, unless you've strained a muscle or been running the marathon or something uh, obvious. The other one is if you raise the foot like this and you're stretching that muscle and it hurts. That's called Homan's sign in physical diagnosis, and that would be a test if there's a blood clot. So it's not proof, and you might confirm it with ultrasound, but that's, that's how you might guess that you're dealing with. And, and in that case, you don't want to massage the calf muscle and, and see if that clot can break loose. There's some things that are good to break loose, like... Uh, waste in the colon, but you don't want to uh, break a clot loose because where is it going to go? It's going it's, no, it's to go to the heart. It's going to go to the heart and then to the lungs. And you get a pulmonary embolus. My, my daughter uh, was out feeding, my other daughter was out feeding her horse and she suddenly felt like she couldn't breathe. And she had had COVID a couple of weeks before. And you know, just like they say after the shot, the vaccination, even after COVID, there's a risk of thrombosis. But she didn't think about anything. She just realized she wasn't feeling good. She was headed to the house to get her cell phone and call her husband when she collapsed in the yard and felt like she was dying. And this was just a few months ago, in, the, in, in January. And I got a call, pray for Luvon. So I did, but I didn't know what was going on until one of her relatives was missing her. She was supposed to go teach horseback riding, and she didn't show up. And when you don't show up on time, there's some reason for it. So the individual that was waiting for her went over to her house and found her unconscious lying in the, in the yard, called 911, and when she got to the hospital, they determined she'd thrown, called a saddle embolus. A saddle embolus is, it means the blood clot is so big that it plugged up the artery to both lungs. And it, it, it fits over where it bifurcates or splits, and it's like a saddle, in other words, it, it knocked out the blood flow from her heart to her lungs. And it's a miracle that she's still alive. And, and you, you should, she, she calls me every week and tells me that she loves me and you know, <laughs> and, and she, she's uh, conducting Bible studies now once a week with a group of ladies that's growing up to about eight or 10 now. And, uh, and she's only 50, but it's changed her life. She, she said, God spared my life for a purpose, and I want to be ready for his coming. Amen. And before that, she mostly was thinking of going golfing in the summer and skiing in the winter. So, I, you know, the, everything works together for good. But uh, there was something that hit us by surprise. And I think it was the, the uh, aftermath of the COVID infection, which created a hypercoagulable state, the, the blood clot formed, and, and it has also happened after the vaccination, and 
and her dentist that she works for was like most professionals was going to require all his workers to be vaccinated and she's a an assistant that helps him with his procedures and she said dad what do you think i don't think i should do that i said i absolutely don't think you should take the shot and run that extra risk on top of the other she said but in the state of maine there there's no religious exemption. You probably heard that that went to the Supreme Court in that state and they threw out any religious exemption. I said, well, you have a reason medically to exempt yourself from it. And uh, she said, but my the pul pulmonary specialist that took care of me, he won't do it. I said, well, since you're married, you have a different last name than mine. Uh, maybe I'll write you one. And so. Her dad wrote her the medical exemption for it. The dentist accepted that, and she's still working there. And because, because she stood her ground on the subject, one of her other colleagues also has been able to stay employed. So, so here's some of the indications. Now, um, let's look at the precautions. Do not use very hot or very cold water in blood vessel diseases of the feet and the legs. Be careful if there's loss of feeling. Avoid areas with tendency to bleed. Would, would you put something that was at a sore that was bleeding and you'd put it in hot water? No. And if massage is given, end with the hot water bath. I told you that. And then finally, disinfect your equipment after each time you use it. How would you disinfect it? What would you use to disinfect the basins and the towels and things like that? Pericide. What? Pericide. Pericide. Peroxide. Per peroxide. Yeah. Oh, that that would work. You could probably use uh, Clorox, a, a drop in. Uh, like you would to sanitize a sink when you're canning, uh, but or Lysol spray, if you can, there was a time last year where you couldn't buy it. It was all gone out of the stores, but it's available now. Yes? Okay, thank you. Did you hear that, brother? Uh, okay, yes. That, that, for anybody in the periphery, some bleach is used to just whiten like you'd put in the laundry for your clothes. And so that's not designed to disinfect. Be sure that you use a kind that says kills 99.9% .9 of all the germs. In fact, on the Lysol bottle over uh, over the years, going back into the 1990s, it, the spray can would say, kills coronavirus. Yeah. Coronavirus is not something new. It's been known for a long time. The only time it was an epidemic was in 2003, called SARS. People coming back from uh, China would be tested for the fever in the airports, and if they had a temperature that was elevated, They'd be sequestered and quarantined and checked out to be sure we didn't get an epidemic in this country. Uh, and, and it got squelched without any lockdown of the general population, but only quarantine of a person potentially sick. That goes back to the Middle Ages. That goes back to the times of Moses. Uh, leprosy, for example, they were quarantined. And put in what today we call leprosariums. Uh, and so, so that's, that's a different situation. Okay, now let's, I think I've covered the equipment that you can use. Do you see this picture of a, a basin that has two divisions, one for hot and one for cold? Yes. Oh, I, sorry. I, Yes, if you have large varicose veins and, and changes on the skin called 
uh, stasis dermatitis, if you have uh, large veins and they're tender or sores on the veins, then this, this would be a caution. Yes, good question. Does that mean after a year or what if you do it for less time? Less temperature variation, yes. Okay, now what I, what I would normally do is have a little prayer, not necessarily before and after, but at some time where it seems most appropriate, uh, ask the Lord to bless that kind of treatment. One year I was asked to demonstrate this on 3ABN, and uh, the subject, like Brother Hank, was uh, Dr. Warren Peters, who's now at Loma Linda and in charge of a preventive medicine department. So he was laying on the table, and, and I was giving him hot packs on his, and the, all these great big cameras that they have there were filming it, and, and, and he whispered to me, he said, Richard, don't forget to pray. <laughs> he, and he, he, was, he could have just as easily been giving me the treatments and, and, and all, but because uh, we were classmates, we're the same vintage. But uh, this, this we've covered too. So, very good. Now, I think I've covered those issues and that one too. You see, one had a basin with a foot on each side. Here's a red one and a blue one. So if you ever wonder which is hot and which is cold, if you're a plumber that's putting in PEX pipe and you want a red pipe and a blue pipe, yeah, uh, but probably you don't need that to tell the temperature. Just look where the ice cubes are floating. Yes. But, you know, I put my feet into, into warm water, warm, hot and cold, hot and cold, and I do the trick on time, but uh, yes. is it neuropathy, or, or what is, what is uh, related to that? Well, it has to do with your circulation and how much exercise you've gotten through the day. Uh, people that are more overweight, they, they're less likely to have cold feet. But if your feet are cold and you're trying to sleep, you will not go to sleep so readily. Uh, in, in Maine, they would take a brick and put it in the wood stove and then wrap it in a towel and stick it in the bed. Uh, nowadays, people use electric blankets and we're so soft, you know, in our Western culture. But I would just, put, just put socks on. And, uh, and, or drink a... a glass of herb tea before going to bed, so some hot water to warm your body, or take a, a hot shower just before going into bed. There's many ways to warm the body, and then you get to sleep just like that if you've done labor. The laboring man, the Bible says the sleep is sweet, but the sluggard, he tosses and turns. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, thank you. Did you hear that? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Very, very good idea. I'll have to try that out. I, I do physicals on truck drivers for their, for their physical form, and, and, I, and many of them come in and they're nervous about passing because they drive a a truck and, and that they have to have that certificate. And some of them come in with a cup of coffee or two and their blood pressures are high. And I, I should try the hot foot bath. I have them lay down and I talk about trucks instead of medical things and try to divert their stress. But uh, that's, that's very good what you said. 
Okay. Now let's go to another subject. Um, and and there's a place for just a plain hot foot bath without the contrast. We always do that before starting like fomentations or or a general hydrotherapy treatment, but the heat will shift the blood, which is a fixed amount, from one part of your body to another. For the head, we're pulling it out of the upper body and bring it down to the lower extremities with a hot foot bath. And, and we can increase the flow and relieve congestion that way and relax tense muscles. Uh, tense muscles don't need the cold contrast. They need the heat. So a hot foot bath would be very similar to the uh, hot and cold, just with heat. And I'm going to show you how to do that on a table up here. And so we're going to take the hot foot bath up here. We'll use it still. And would you like to... And, and I, you notice this kind of a basin is, before you put, put your feet in, I'll just put them on each side like that. Um, you want to be sure that the person is comfortable on the table. He, he isn't uh, hunched over at all like some people that are older and they need a pillow under their head. But uh, if, if we needed anything to support, a little bolster like this, or you can get small pillows at Bed Bath and & Beyond, and uh, that would be less comfortable than just straight. So, so, but they should have some sort of cover on them. This has a, a, a pillowcase cover. Now again, with a hot foot bath, test it out. This water is cooled off some, so I'll just add a little more hot water. Now, it should go without saying that when you're adding hot water, there may become a point in time where you need to take some water out. Otherwise, what's going to happen? It'll overflow. So there's no need to have a mess. And, and I have done this kind of therapy in a bed, and it's even more important to be careful not to flood the bed. So how would you protect the bed? Put some plastic on. Yes, okay, now we'll, this is just fine. Bring your feet up and in. This will be a, and you will slide it up a little bit. Okay, now when you're doing it this way, it's very, easy to take a, a light blanket, try not to put it in the water. Do you think that a person would get warm with their feet in hot water and a blanket over them? And if you need to, you can pull it up. And what I do here, if I need to cover this part, I take a piece of cardboard and cut it in a semi-moon shape and just use it on top or a thin piece of plastic or plywood that's rigid so that you've covered it with a lid. Then you can pull the blanket up and over, but it needs a cutout for the, for the legs. Can you, you get the idea of that? For, for a department where you're actually doing this on a regular basis, accumulate the materials that you're going to need. Now, again, in the hot water, what's going to happen to his head? He's going to get real warm. And I'm mostly talking to you, but I would uh, spend more time talking to the person. And when you're giving a hydrotherapy treatment, can I take your glasses off? Okay. Okay. Yeah. There. 
This is not the time to tell him about the mark of the beast, or the new world order, or the, or, or the, the coming election, or your political uh, leanings and burdens. Why? You don't increase a person's stress, especially if you don't know where they're coming from and what their thinking is. I mean, you don't, you don't hammer the, the, the person, even if they're your best friend. This is, the, this is the place to relax and put your case in God's hands. Does that feel good on your head? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, I was, I was almost going to mention that yesterday, but you, there's all kinds of uh, boom boxes that have a slot for a CD, and you can, uh, I like instrumental music, uh, like Monobani, some of those sacred things uh, that are just relaxing music. Not new age music that goes bong, 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 bing, 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 and, and goes nowhere, but something that has a melody that doesn't distract you, and, and background that's soft. Uh, it's, it's very nice to do that. You, you, some of them have nature sounds where they have birds singing and all, but if you have birds out there and open the window, you'll, they'll sing to you. You put a bird feeder right outside. Yes, uh, Emily. Right. It is passive yes. Thank you. That, not a lot of talking. Now, we're violating that today, of course, for the sake of the class. But the dentist that I go to, he's got a television up there on the ceiling. He's got one on the corner. And when I go in, uh, the first thing I ask them to do is turn it off. Because they have windows, and then there's a little pond out there. And I say, I want to look at the for nutria, which I'm not too enthralled with, but there's often uh, ducks and birds. Okay, now I won't prolong this, but this is a preamble to fomentation treatments. And, but I want to talk about that a little before I get into that. So I'll show you how we finish a hot foot bath. Let's see. In a treatment room, this is a very easy way to do it. And uh, you just lift the feet out. Let's do one at a time. And I would prefer a pitcher to this. <laughs> and you don't need to get any personal pleasure out of torturing people with ice water on their feet, so pour a little on the other foot. Because it's not very comfortable any more than turning the cold shower on is comfortable after taking a hot shower. Now, would you get, would you help me with that? Okay. Now, I should have had the towel ready, but uh, since he is physically fit enough to hold his legs up in the air. Now, right down there, okay. I'm t this is where you have your fellowship lunches, so I'm trying not to make a big puddle anywhere. But hydrotherapy needs to be done with dispatch and efficiency as much as possible. So if you can think in advance what you're going to need and have it available, your client or patient will be more impressed. Do you still need a pitcher? I just had one. A pitcher? Oh. If you had one, you still need it. No, no, I'm okay right now. Thank you. Oh, I'll bring it here. I'll show you what I. This is a pitcher. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, young man. I appreciate that. Okay. Anything like that will work. 
And again, dry, cover, and let them rest. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Yes, that's true. And it's, it's more important in surgery than any other place or the delivery room because you might have an emergency. But what we're doing is helping him to relax and, uh, and then remembering the other details. This would, this would help a cold, flu, cough, but what, what we'd combine it with is fomentations to the chest, hot and cold here, and just heat on the feet. And I'm going to do it in phases to just illustrate that. This will relieve uh, pelvic cramps, menstrual, not for this brother, but for, you know, <laughs> for those who have the cycles. Uh, the time, time of the month, cramps. You can warm up a person in preparation for massage. And here's the bottom one here is really interesting to help stop a nosebleed. Normally what we would do is put pressure on the side of the nose that's bleeding, direct pressure. If that didn't work, we'd put an ice pack over the upper sinuses here, and, and that would shrink the, but the third line of defense is down at the other end of drawing blood away from the head. And, and I have seen that work. I've seen it work in some people that had high blood pressure. And so that would be a kind of a, complicated way to stop a nosebleed, but sometimes they are persistent. And, and that would be short of cauterizing the bleeding spot or things that you'd need special instruments or skill to do. Are you comfortable there? Okay. Now, the next part is to go to the fomentations. I put all the details about this, uh, that, but I've already covered it with you, so I'm fast forwarding through the slides. Now, fomentation, or the old fashioned uh, nurses call them foamies for short. Uh, what is a fomentation? It's, it's a hot pack that's done usually with towel. And if you want to make some fomentations, get a big bath towel, not a super thick one, but one about like this texture, and you can fold it. A good fomentation would be maybe four-folded, like that. This is a good size. And then what do you do with it? You, you want to sew it so it stays in the same shape, so you're not folding it up all the time. If you're making a fomentation, uh, crisscross with your sewing machine, usually an uh, average sewing machine will sew through terry cloth, four layers, uh, with a fairly sturdy needle and you know thread, you, you want it to be adequate. So you go around the edge and then crisscross twice, and it's going to stay in that shape. Now, some people actually put muslin in between so that it makes it thicker, but it's, it's stiffer too. And, and a fomentation is an application of a hot, wet cloth or towel to a body part to relieve pain in nerves, muscles, joints, and increase the circulation. And soothe and sedate. So how would we use this? We can use it for chest congestion, 
Do you think this would help with COVID if it was in your chest? Yes. Absolutely. Don't immediately run off to the emergency room for an injection of monoclonal antibodies uh, and, or be... Yeah, oh, wonderful. Yeah. Okay. This is a fomentation. <laughs> you see the sewing? Can you, can you all see that? And uh, somebody has sewed it up very nicely. And, and this is a thinner cloth than a towel, but uh, like cotton material. And inside might be wool, a layer of wool. So that, that makes a good fomentation. Now, what... Because it, it um, holds the moisture so well, and it, and it stays warm longer. We used to use a wool sock when I was a kid, and I was always wondering why a wool sock. Yeah. Well, wool is, if you live in the cold north, wool is your friend. And it doesn't have to be itchy and scratchy. It can be a very soft wool, too. My, what, if you're, you want cotton. You want something else, yes. I, I uh, had a man come to me one time and he, his, his nose was running constantly and his skin was itching and I did some allergy tests on him and he was allergic to wool and his job was uh, shearing sheep and, his, <laughs> and he slept under a wool blanket and he was wearing a wool shirt and wool socks and uh, you know, I, the cure was quite simple but you had to make the diagnosis. So, so three ways to dampen this. One way is to, in a shower. And I just go about two or three times that way and two or three times this way and, and just dampen it. The other is to spray with, uh, you know, a kitchen sink has a spray device usually and so you can spray it. And so or you can use a bottle that has a spray like people use when they're ironing. And so you just dampen it. And then how do we heat it? One way to heat it is to roll it loosely like this and stick it in a plastic bag, like a bread bag. Or, and then you can microwave it for about four minutes. What's that? Yeah, that, well, I'm starting, you, you can microwave it, and it'll come out steamy. But it may be so hot that you have to wear a mitt to handle it. A, a second way you can do it is in a canning kettle that has a false bottom, or, or they have a rack that you use if you can turn the rack over or put a, a, a handmade rack that holds it out of the water. So you put this much water in the bottom of a canning kettle, uh, a big pot, and, and you can steam it. If you're doing that, I would usually put them vertical because the steam penetrates them better than if they're lying flat. Uh, a third way is to wrap it in aluminum foil and put it in the oven. Aluminum foil in the oven is better than putting it in plastic in the oven. <laughs> and and uh, and you all know why. But don't put it in aluminum foil and put it in the microwave. I mean, you, you've got to use your, your kitchen skills as well as your hydrotherapy knowledge. So, so you can put it in the oven in aluminum foil and you take it out and it's going to be steamy hot. Again, don't just grab it with your bare hands. Use an oven mitt and, uh, or tongs to handle it when it's super hot. Oh, in an oven, uh, probably 200, 250. It doesn't have to be uh, bread baking temperatures. Uh, that would be enough. And, and, and I think you could probably do it in five minutes, maybe 10. I, I don't know exactly. And each oven is a little different too. Now, you don't just spray some water on it. Now, if you're, if you're doing it without any fomentations and just with towels, 
you could take the towel, and usually two people need to work together on this, but you could put it down in boiling water, and then, help me out here with your, hold on to one end, and, and you hold, hold it in a, a U-shape over the pot, or over a sink, and twist it like that. And, and as you're twisting it, you're wringing out the water. That's another way to do it. I don't think that's quite as good because you have much more boiling hot water in it and less steam. Thank you. So, so those are ways to do it. Now, if we take the fomentation, yes. Thank you. And so there was always the towel to keep it from burning, then the really hot towel, and then the towel, the dry towel on top to hold yes. the steam in. Yes, that's right. And I was just going to, I was just going to share that. Thank you for uh, prompting me. But one way to do it would, before you get to the person, would be to wrap it up in a towel like this, and then you've got a towel underneath, and you've got a towel on top. So we could put this on the chest. Uh, but if you have smaller towels or you want to do it uh, the other way with a towel and a fomentation and another towel, or instead of the top towel, just pull the blanket up over it, uh, that, that will work too. So, so this, this is for the chest or the abdomen and you don't do both at the same time, do one or the other. And if I'm doing a chest for like a pneumonia or flu, then I would put one underneath the back at the same time, and, and I would slide it under and leave it there like this. L sit, sit right up if you can. And I'd go right down to the hip, and I'd have one on the back, to warm up the spine and warm up the back, and then I'd have the cold compress on the head, and then one on the chest. Then your whole torso is getting heated. Now, I'll take this one back, because I want to illustrate how to do this. Well, you're treating two different things. You're either treating bloating and cramps in the abdomen, or you're treating congestion in the chest. Uh, very few people are saying everything hurts. If that's the case, and th if that's the case, then crawl in that tub down the hall there, and soak in the in the hot water. So symptoms are the indicator of how you use this. Yes, yes, but you don't have to have a, a total course in nursing or medicine to to know how to read symptoms. Everybody can tell where they hurt, or where they're cough is coming from, or where they're bloating, you know. And so, so usually we just treat the part that needs the help. And plus, when we're bringing heat or circulation to an area and then wanting it to leave, you, don't, you can't do that with the whole body all at the same time. Uh, in, unless you do immersion in a tub and then immersion in the cold or a, or a cold shower. So, so this is a fomentation that we would use for the chest, and, and I would tuck it in, not heating the arms. Now, let's suppose we have this really hot and steamy, and the person says, it's getting hot on my shoulder. What are you going to do to keep from burning the person? Because you have to listen, and if they say it's too hot, you don't say, oh, you're just making, <laughs> making a story. You can do uh, two or three different ways to alleviate that. Just lift it up like this, let some air get in, and then put it down. That may be enough. The second thing you can do is raise it up and rub your hand over the area that's sweating and getting hot and, and wipe the sweat away. 
and, and that will uh, relieve it. The third thing you can do is put another towel underneath. You see, it's very important to not burn the person. And, and, and don't ever uh, hesitate to respond if they say, this is getting too hot. I, I know of one sanitarium institution where the hydrotherapy was being done and, and they weren't perceptive enough to know that the person had had a stroke and was, had lost some sensation in the area. And, and ended up getting some burns on his legs and on his back. And, uh, and when they all healed up in just a few days, but the family were not so forgiving. Right. And they went to the lawyer. Oh, yes. And that treatment cost the institution $20,000. Wow. And, and I, I remember how bad I felt at losing God's money for a lawsuit over an incident like that. And, and I, I said to, this was in, at Wildwood, I said to Elder Prezi, shall we quit? And he straightened up like a general in the military and he said, absolutely not, we will go forward. And I'd never heard him speak with such authority before. And, and I was standing there, we were taking a walk outdoors while we were talking about this and I, straightened up and I, I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and, and we went forward, you know, and recovered. Uh, and then he taught me that Ellen White herself was sued one time in Australia over a, a situation of alienation of affection, uh, a friv another frivolous lawsuit that cost her several thousand dollars. And it didn't slow her down either. But it, it's, it's painful and probably would be more than 5,000 these days. But, okay, now that's, that's the fomentation. We would use about three minutes, and then we would do a quick, cold contrast. Here's how I, I do that. Do you know what this is? This is a mitten. And you can make your own by taking two washcloths and sew, sewing them together and making mittens like this. And it just so happens that there's their color contrast, not to direct traffic, you know. And so so let's, let's do the mittens in the cold water. This uh, revs up the circulation really good. And uh, what I normally do after, whoops, a few ice cubes are going bye-bye. Take this off, toss it aside. We'll just pull it up and I'll just do a quick quickie here. Okay. Take your dog tag and put it somewhere too. Okay. Now, normally you wouldn't have a t-shirt on, and, and, and as you rub, then do a quick flip, and you're using the other side. Okay, and then what do we do? Where's our towel? Let's take our towel, dry the skin, then you're ready for another fomentation. And you can do three of them. And, uh, and I use this same method when I do a general hydrotherapy treatment on the arms, on the back, on the legs. Be really careful to not rub sensitive areas in, in the genital or breasts for ladies or, or uh, around the face. But here's how we do it on the cold mitten friction. The friction of the terry cloth is really good. And then do a quick flip and you got the other side, and you're, and then a couple of strokes to regain your friendship. <laughs> yeah, try to, and massage should always be toward the heart, 
the friction can be up and down, but any stroking that's putting pressure, bring the blood toward the heart. Yeah. Okay, and then, and then we always tuck the part we've just done the friction underneath, and you can see what, by the time you've done the left arm, the right arm, the legs, the back, the chest, be a little gentle around the abdomen, don't rub real briskly, and you've got the person ready to just take a, a sleep for a little while. And you just spread out the blanket and say night, night, and the Lord bless you and keep you and help you to be well. And, and you know, uh, this, this takes time, but time is what binds you to people. Uh, just like in your home, in your marriage, in your, with your children and your grandchildren, you spend time and you've, you've won their confidence. And that's what Jesus did. You know, that's, he, he didn't take jet airplanes or helicopters, Air Force One or Marine One. He, he walked with his disciples from place to place. And do you suppose they did any talking while they were traveling? And, and it was all training, all passing on information. And they felt like the greatest privilege in the world had been granted them, which it was. So, so I'll let you get up and, and sit down now. Yeah. He just had his half hour siesta. And. Uh, Well, let's see. That's a good question. Uh, how much did Jesus charge for his uh, ministries to people? <laughs> he didn't charge, did any of them make donations? Well, where, where do you think they got the expenses. And who, who kept the money? Judas, Judas was, the, he, he carried the bag. That means that people were so grateful that they would make donations to help with the, the ministry of Jesus. But he didn't collect the money and stick it in his pocket. He let one of his 12, the, the one the disciples elected, and who should have been the treasurer? Matthew should have been the treasurer because he was used to handling money and was an honest uh, person. Judas was a thief, but the disciples thought he was the most financially able and, and would do the best job. So, okay, now I'm going to go through some information here with you. Uh, oh, uh, on that subject of remuneration, when we do this out of a church, it doesn't seem appropriate that you have a fee schedule uh, posted on the wall beside the hydrotherapy department. But if people want to make a contribution toward the, the, the work of health education or ministry, wouldn't that be an appropriate thing to, to allow them to do? Why, sure. Uh, and so, so in the book Ministry of Healing, it says that people will come into their homes without compensation and, and that the last work to be done is going to be med medical missionary work that will be done with the greatest sacrifice ever seen before. So even now, uh, we have most of our medical institutions have become medical mercenary work rather than medical missionary work. And to see how much we can get out of people and make sure before they walk in the door that they've got their insurance cards and all. And I suppose many here have insurance and Medicare and things like that, and there's not a thing in the world wrong with getting that benefit uh, out of the government that you've been paying for all through the years. But, but this isn't going to be done 
necessarily under a license of a clinic, but it's a ministry of the church. Do you think that will be a protection in the time of trouble when they try to shut down religious organizations? Will, Will it? Will having a health ministry that's serving the public, will that help to protect the rest of what's going on under these uh, shingles? Yes. Why, absolutely. Ellen White says it will serve and protect the body. Because will there be uh, sick people in the end of time? Lots of them. Lots of them. Uh, Councils on Health 506 says when the season of distress comes, there will be many, not only among our own people, but also those who do not know the truth. And we are to uh, understand causes and cures of their diseases. And she says there will be a field of service everywhere. Forgive the paraphrase because the whole paragraph doesn't come into my memory right now. But it's going to be a a very special time where the last work will be mostly volunteer and including service for neighbors. Have any of you ever mowed a lawn and not been paid for? I don't mean your own lawn. I mean somebody else's. (laughs) You know, there's there's a tendency to want to be paid for everything we do. And, and, and while you might want to have uh, a nurse or a hydrotherapist or a massage therapist or a physician, somebody with a license that kind of oversees things and, and makes sure that it meets uh, professional standards, do we want just licensed professionals doing all these treatments? I don't think you... You want to limit it because who is supposed to learn these treatments and do them? Every church member. And that doesn't mean just the laity because I don't believe in a laity in a ministry. I believe that we're all one. And that means the ministers are supposed to learn these things too and be able to minister to the sick as well as preach. And the people that minister to the sick are supposed to be able to teach. One of the best times to teach is when you have somebody laying right here in a captive audience and say, now, you know, this, this is the physiology that helps your circulation, but if you want to help your digestion, you also have to work on what goes into your mouth and what you're eating, and, and if you want to help your soul, it's what goes into your mind and what you're thinking, And are we just all part of one body, mind, and spirit? Is it all one? Yes, you can't separate this. So so this this is all working together. Now, I want to go through some more details about the fomentations. Use it for uh, painful nerves like neuralgia. Somebody said tic dolorou, that's a neuralgia of the facial nerve, the trigeminal nerve, and the heat goes there. The, the um, shingles is another disease where the nerve is inflamed, and they get a rash, and they usually get a little fever, and shingles is caused by a virus that is the same virus as chickenpox. And if you've had chicken pox as a child, you probably won't get shingles. Or if you do, it'll be when you're 70 or 80 or 90 years old and going through a major stress. And, and I know one, one lady, she, she came down with shingles. She was in her mid-70s. And her son had just asked her to leave the home and not bother them. And the son's wife kind of hated his, her mother-in-law. And it hurt her so deeply. And she started getting this rash on her chest and the pain in the nerves. Shingles. It can affect the nerves of the face, the nerves on the 
chest or the abdomen, the nerves down the leg, usually one place only and on one side only. And, and I don't know why, but that's a neuralgia caused by a virus. And heat is a great help at fighting it. When a, when a child gets chicken pox, what do you see as the mother or the parent? First thing, they run a fever. And then they start breaking out in a rash. And then you know what it is, but at first it's a, a, a fever. But the fever helps burn out the virus. And the fever uh, keeps the virus from multiplying or replicating. These viruses, the pox virus, which would also include the chicken pox, the smallpox, and the monkey pox, cannot stand fever. And when, they, when your body generates a fever, you are fighting the virus. And so at 101.6 degrees, that virus cannot multiply. Yes? Yes, well, the, the reason is that the shingles vaccine is a live virus. A live virus means it's a virus that can cause disease. Some viruses are killed viruses, like the polio vi uh, virus shots. The oral polio virus, called the Sabin, was on, like on a sugar cube, and that was a live virus. And I have seen uh, young people get polio wow. after being near like a, a baby that had had that uh, oral Sabin virus. So they're off the, off the market now. That could be, I don't know. But the, the only polio vaccines that are used now is a killed virus and it's a shot, and, and it's uh, as, as safe as any vaccine is going to be because it's a killed virus, and polio itself is a killer disease. So I, I don't want to see those come back. When I was a young physician, and that was a couple years ago, <laughs> I, took, I took care of the senior citizen of, the, of polio. She had been a polio victim in an iron lung longer than anybody else in America. She got it when she was 16. She was a high school swimming athlete, and, and now she's paralyzed from here down, and the only thing she could move was her little toe a little bit. Uh, that when I gave a lecture on exercise and she was sitting in her wheelchair, she said, see, Dr. Hansen, I'm, I'm exercising. I said, good for you, Joni. You're actually doing the best you can, because otherwise nurses had to do everything for her, feed her, and, uh, and the, only, the thing I remember, which I treasure, is that when she woke up in the morning in this iron lung, have you, any of you ever seen an iron lung? Uh, the long metal tube with l windows and portholes in the side, and a rubber diaphragm at one end, and a, and a rubber a thing around the neck at the other end, so only your head is out, and, and everything else is inside the chamber, and the other end has a big arm sucking and pulling to uh, make you breathe, otherwise she'd die. And so, so in the morning, Joni would be lying there, flat on her back all night long, and she'd reach over, because she could move her neck, and grab a little stick and touch a button and call the nurse. And she said, 
I'm, I'm ready for my morning devotions. And over her head was a, a wire rack, and they opened the Bible and lay it up there on the rack. And she would read the Bible and have her morning devotions. And then after breakfast, after she was fed and, and bathed, she would, the March of Dimes got a wheelchair with a big bellows on it that would keep her breathing, and she'd sit up with a stick in her mouth and type on a electric typewriter and write letters to people. And the paper was one of these long, like a paper towels, so it, she kept writing and writing and writing for a couple hours, sending letters to handicapped people all over the country to encourage them. She formed an organization called New Horizons. And this was before people knew about Joni Erickson. This was a previous Joni. So, you know, whatever uh, they say, if life hands you lemons, you learn to make lemonade. You know, and she made the best of her circumstance. Uh, one of her benefactors was the vice president of Pan Am Airways, and he would come once a year to see her and, and check on, make sure she was getting well taken care of. So fomentations, we've, we've come up with this. Now, difficulty sleeping. If you can't sleep, and, and you're helping somebody get to sleep, take a fomentation and put it right along their back. And just warm up the spine. Uh, and, and then do a little rub down and a prayer. And uh, I have seen nurses do that. And the next morning the person says, by the way, who was that angel that came in during the night and helped me get, to, get off to sleep? And, it, and she didn't have wings. But she was wearing a white dress because back in those days the nurses wore white dresses. And, uh, and she was actually uh, thought to be like an angel. How uh, long did you use On the back, I would just let the person go off to sleep and leave it there and not disturb them again. It'll cool off. I just put heat. Now, if you have an electric heating pad, like the Thermofor, or this one is a competitor called the Hydrotherapad, which is the same, it has little lead strips in here and, and a coil of wires that heat up. But what you do is put it under a cover of wool or something similar that has moisture in it. You don't wet it. it. Wool just absorbs moisture. And, and then you've got moist heat. So this particular one, th this is called cheating, where you take the rubber band and hold the button down. But uh, the new ones are all uh, low, medium, and high. This was what I call the safety switch, where if you fall asleep, it'll actually go off and you won't overheat the person. They, they will, yeah. So, so they've figured out a way to make it safer. OK. Now, any questions so far on this? We've been here qu quite a while, and I want to make sure that I answer your questions as well as cover just a little more material. Moist heat distributes better, and, and it actually uh, is better on the skin than dry heat is. As, as like, a, like being in a steam bath or a sauna, they've put water on the stones rather than in dry heat like in a in Arizona in the summer when it's 130 degrees and just as dry as can be. Your skin dries out more. Your mucous membranes dry out more when there's no moisture. Yes, right. Now, the, the other, th speaking of which, um, while you're doing a, a treatment that lasts 30 or 40 minutes, offer the person a little sip of water 
If they're lying down, you want a straw in the cup. And if they're sitting up, of course, you can drink out of a cup. But uh, water is part of the remedy internally as well as externally. And most of us could use a little more water, which, which I think would be good now to give you a little break and ask you all to stand up and stretch and get a little water and, and then come back and we'll kind of wrap it up with a few more questions and uh, final comments. Yes, there she is. Yeah, there's YouTube videos. That's true. Thank you for mentioning that. 